Nicodemus taught at Cambridge for 40 years. He wrote a well-revered book on systematic theology. He disputed um, the difference between consubstantiation and transubstantiation with revered theologians and was highly regarded by all who went to his class. And he was also a warden in his church and was an academic and of high regard, but also somebody who the church leaned on to make sure that they were being doctrinally correct at all times. And he liked his office, and he liked his students, and he was very bored. Suddenly there was this guy named Jesus who not only hadn't attended Cambridge, but hadn't even attended a semester of seminary. And in John's Gospel, the first time that you become aware of Jesus, and Nicodemus becomes aware of Jesus, was when he attended a wedding in Cana where they ran out of wine. And he took water and he turned that water into wine. And for those who were there that day, this miracle represented this lavish, extravagant love of God that just seemed to pour out of this guy wherever he went. He was known as a party guy. And people loved to listen to him and to be with him. And then the next time that Nicodemus heard about Jesus was not long afterwards when he showed up at the temple. And he went with a whip and he drove out all of the people who were selling sheep and ox and cattle for sacrifice. And he dumped over the money changers' tables. And he told them to stop making his father's house into a place of merchandise, into a yard sale, into a flea market. The zeal of God had overcome him. And he was in lots of trouble with the church leaders for causing a scene on Sunday morning in the middle of worship. And Nicodemus listened to the church leaders and how upset they were about this, and Nicodemus agreed and froed his brow, but something inside of Nicodemus' heart started to skip a little bit. And he realized Jesus, something about Jesus, was making him feel alive in a way that he hadn't felt alive since the moment of his baptism. <clears throat> Couldn't put his finger on it, but he felt like 30 years younger, just even hearing about Jesus. But Jesus was really getting into some hot water with the institutional church. And Nicodemus was on the church council and absolutely was responsible for keeping things seemly and in order. But he couldn't resist. He couldn't resist having an opportunity to go and talk to this crazy carpenter and see for himself what this man was all about. But he couldn't do it during the day because he couldn't have anyone seeing that he was actually going to go over to Jesus' house and spend time with this guy who was getting into all kinds of trouble in church. So he waited until it was night. And while he was walking over, he was thinking about how honored Jesus was going to feel when this great, prestigious academic church leader knocked on his door 
and deigned to call him rabbi, which is the word for teacher. And he was feeling very humble because he was going to go do this, just like showing his own humility by going in front of the simple layman. And he imagined when he got there that probably they'd share a glass of sherry and they would have an opportunity to perhaps talk about the right age for confirmation. Should it be 10 or should it be 13? Or perhaps talk about whether we should have an open or a closed Eucharist. Should Eucharist just be for believers or should it be an open table? And they would have a very rigorous discussion and it would be refreshing. And maybe Nicodemus would leave able to capture some of that fire that Jesus had and use it perhaps in a paper that he'd write or a sermon he'd give the following Sunday. So Nicodemus knocks on the door at about 10 o'clock at night, and Jesus answers. And Nicodemus calls him rabbi and says, we know, not I know, we know, meaning the entire Sanhedrin, all of the great teachers of the church, the bishop and the presiding bishop and all the deacons and all the clergy, we all know that you are from God. And he doesn't say, we all know you are from God because of how you teach. Because Nicodemus is a teacher. But instead, Nicodemus says, we all know that you are from God because of what you do. No one could do the things that you do without being from God. And I would think that Nicodemus is waiting for Jesus to blush and say something like, oh, shucks, thanks, Nicodemus. (laughs) But instead, Jesus says to Nicodemus, well, thanks, but you're barking up the wrong tree. If you're coming here to have a conversation about Donatism or the Desert Fathers, I'm not going to give you any of that. I didn't go to seminary. I'm Jesus, the carpenter. And you came here because of what I do, not because of what I teach. And the only way for you to understand me is for you to accept and believe in me. I can say that I believe that George Washington was the first president of the United States. Why? Well, because I see him on money and because my teacher showed me and it's in textbooks and I have convincing evidence that that's the case. And so, because I have that convincing evidence, I believe it. Jesus has turned that all around. He's not talking about believing that way. He's talking about believing in him. Believing in is giving up your control and trusting in somebody else to do the steering. And I think what Nicodemus would really like is to just absorb something from Jesus and go back to his office and have a nice cigar and carry on with his life. That's what Nicodemus, maybe that's what you want. Sometimes it's what I want. Jesus, just give me some advice that makes my life a little bit more interesting or comfortable or enlightens me in some way. And then I can use that, kind of like saran wrap, right? (laughs) Can use it and keep fresh. That's what I'm interested in. That's what Nicodemus wants. But Jesus is saying, you just got to basically scrap your entire life. If you want to believe, if you want to have what I have to offer, you have to believe in me, which means that you have to kind of scrap your entire life up till now and start all over again, and this time believing in me. Nicodemus is 
flabbergasted and doesn't understand what Jesus is saying. And Jesus, I think, probably feels sorry for him and says, Nicodemus, the only way forward in this conversation is if you're ready to be born again. Start all over. I'm going to go back to this whole idea that Nicodemus was right about. I think it might be the only thing in this conversation that Nicodemus is right about. The only thing is when Nicodemus says, um, no one can do what you do if they're not sent from God. Nicodemus is focused on what Jesus does, not what Jesus says. I have found it personally in my own life to be the case. I've spent a lot of time reading commentaries on Scripture. I have snored through some really miserable theology classes, and I have gone to school, and I've gotten B's on my papers. I've passed through. But I do know that the only way I've ever actually understood what Jesus is talking about is if I actually just took him at face value and tried out something that he said to do. (laughs) Completely face value. He says to do a bunch of things. And usually when he says them, your first reaction is like, oh, I could do that. And then you think about it for 15 seconds and you're like, no, 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 I can't do that. (laughs) Like, let's just think about a few of them, right? Think about, um, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. I'm like, oh, yeah, I could totally, I could totally forgive people's sins. And then I start thinking about what Jesus is asking me to forgive And telling me that my forgiveness that I'm asking from him should be the same, which is like I have all kinds of things to ask Jesus for forgiveness for. Really bad things I'm not going to share with you because you wouldn't want me to be your priest. So, like, I've got got this list of stuff I really want Jesus to forgive me for. And he's like, okay, well, you go forgive somebody like you're asking me to forgive you. And I'm like, can I get back to you on that? Uh, I think I have to go to therapy first, right? Something like that. That's just it. That's one of them. Or, or how about pray that God give you this day your daily bread? Yeah, but I got kids to get through college. Um, I'm concerned about the state of the world. I don't know what's going to happen next. I wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning thinking about what I heard on the news and worrying about where my grandchildren are going to wind up if I ever get grandchildren. And I'm freaking out because I'm trying to be my own God. Because if I can work it out for myself and my family, then everything will be cool. I can't let God be God because you never know how that's going to turn out, right? (laughs) And so Jesus is saying, just ask for what you need today. And I'm like, ooh, I can maintain that for about 15 seconds and not much more, right? Right? And here's the last one. This is the one I'm going to talk to you about today. This whole business of loving, just Jesus says, go love your neighbor as yourself. Ouch. I'm not going to get my neighbor a 401k. Right? I mean, come on. What do you mean love my neighbor as myself? All right. So since it's hard to figure out exactly what that means, because can it actually mean take care of your neighbor the way you take care of yourself? That is, like, overwhelming. I would suggest this. Just try to do something instead of nothing. I'm going to talk to you about a time, since it's Trinity Sunday, when I tried to love my neighbor as myself, just figuring, okay, I'm going to take him at his word and see what happens. I was invited. This is another church. Um, I was invited. After going and knocking at the door of the church, uh, at the door of the mosque, in Boot, New Jersey, to come in. Um, It was a huge regional mosque, and I figure if my job is to go love my neighbors myself, probably I should go introduce myself, and that would be the minimum, the bare minimum, right? So I slog over and go to the mosque, set up a meeting with the president, who is extremely gracious, and he opens the doors of the mosque, 
And he takes me in and he's showing me their very beautiful worship space. And he's explaining to me how the men worship here and the women worship over there in a much less beautiful space um, that is quite a bit smaller. And so I'm asking a boss about, well, how can this be that the women are over there and you guys are over here? Why are you guys divide up like that? And he looks at me like, oh, you bleeding heart feminist liberal Episcopalian priest, you. <laughs> Let me explain. The reason that we do it this way is because the men really need to be able to focus on God and not be distracted by the presence of beautiful women. Aren't you? Yeah. Aren't you charmed? And I'm like, I'm not going to tell you what I'm thinking, which is, if you're feeling distracted by the presence of women, why don't you go worship in that little room over there and we'll worship in here. Thanks. And so we're being polite to each other, and I'm like, oh, great. And, and Abbas says, Lori, come to us. This is the Trinity part. Come to us um, during worship. We're going to honor you. Come to us during worship and share with us the doctrine of the Trinity. Muslims are not into the doctrine of the Trinity. I found this out at the mosque. <laughs> Here's something that you could probably look up on Google and be more prepared than I was. I brought my little egg, and I was going to explain, see, it's one egg. It has a shell, it has a white, and it has a yolk. Three in one. Ta-da! Here's the problem with that. This is the Jews and Muslims. They listen to us, and they're like, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Let me introduce you to a concept monotheism. That means one. So you can stop with the magic tricks and let's get back to the idea that we all descend from Abraham and we worship what? Not No, 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 no. Not three. Not three. What do we worship? One. So I'm standing there with my egg not knowing that the way this is going to fall out, and people aren't feeling enlightened listening to me. They're just sucking their teeth looking at me and rolling their eyes, especially these two women up in front. One's name I find out later is Matita, and the other one is Heather. And they're giggling and laughing. I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. And so I realize I'm bombing. And then some guy over there raises his hand and says, don't you understand Judaism was the first revelation of God. Christianity was the second revelation of God. Islam is the final revelation of God. Why don't you become a Muslim? And at this point, I'm starting to get ticked off, and I'm like, actually, I think Mormonism is the final revelation of God. Why don't you become a Mormon? You did not say that. Yes, I did. You said that? And then we had dinner and we politely nodded each other and I'm like, yeah, goodbye. Right. A few months go by. And during these months, we go to a few other things at the mosque because I've, I've opened this can of worms and you can't close it. And I find we go to, we, we're, we're going to um, dinner and, um, you know, like we're the only Gentiles in the mosque and we're like, yeah, how are you? And um, my kids are running around with Matita's kids and I realized, oh gosh, the kids at the mosque are friends with my kids and they all know each other. And now I'm going, now that I know all these parents, I'm going to have to go, hey, on the playground and we're going to talk and because our kids are making us live like neighbors and so, you know, these things are happening. I'm seeing people at the supermarket, I remember their names and we're developing some kind of relationship. Fine. Fast forward a few months. Um, I just woke up. It's about 8.30 in the morning. Uh, Rosemary's getting the kids breakfast. I'm brushing Lucy's hair. There's a knock at the door because the babysitter is coming to help us get ready. And um, I, I'm late for a meeting. And in walks Colleen, our babysitter. And her eyes are the size of saucers. And I'm like, is everything okay? And Colleen says, No. And so I say, what's going on? And she says, I 
think that you should pull up the shades. So Rose and I pull up the shades. And our, I live in the rectory. Our entire street is full of police cars with flashing lights and an NBC news truck and crime tape. Turns out, early in the morning, this is during Eid, a woman on her way home was shot in the middle of the street coming from the mosque. And it was horrifying. Um, and there was actually no way for me to get to my meeting because the, all the roads were blocked. But now here's the other thing. I had a relationship with Heather and Matita. And I had them on speed dial. And I hit Heather's phone number and I asked her what's going on. And she says, I don't have any idea. And I'll just let you know. I'll let you know what's happening. So we hang up and I'm like, okay, I guess I got to go about my business and do what I'm supposed to do. So I go about my business and about 7 o'clock at night, I'm supposed to have a finance meeting and I'm sitting there with people who have crawled through the, the crime tape to get to the church office and go have this finance meeting. And we're in the middle of it. And all of us are thinking, this is ridiculous. Why are we talking about the bake sale and the budget deficit and where we are on pledges when there's an outline of a woman in the street and there's cops all over the place? What are we going to do? So... We speed dialed our church, and there were about 50 of us, so it took like about five minutes. And also Heather and Natita and Abbas, the president of the mosque. And we said, in an hour, we're going to go out there at the crime scene, since it's right in front of our sidewalk, and we're going to just pray. So if you guys want to show up, that's what we're going to be doing. And we hung up. And we went to the sacristy, where all the holy stuff is kept, and the altar. And we pulled out the Paschal candle and every single candle that we had in the church, including the tapers for midnight mass. And we put them all over the lawn. And members of our church came. And we were all standing in the street. And it was 8 o'clock, and we started to sing. And as we started to sing... Down the hill came a hundred women and men in skull taps and hijabs. And we handed out every candle we had. And we clung to each other's hands and we prayed. Not long after that, Matita and Heather and I, after learning that this woman had been killed by her husband, decided that we were going to hold a community conversation about domestic violence. And the mosque is a lot bigger than St. John's Church, so we held it at the mosque. And four women left abusive relationships. And I still have Heather and Matita on my speed dial. And I don't care what they think about the Trinity anymore. And they don't care about what I think about the Trinity anymore. <laughs> At all. And I call them. And the last time I called them was when we were reading Genesis at Bible study, and we got to the part about Ishmael. And I know this because of the people at the mosque. We were talking about Ishmael, and I said, well, you know, if you're Muslim, Ishmael is basically like their Isaac. Like, their sto our story keeps going from Abraham to Isaac. Theirs goes from Abraham to Ishmael. And... People at the Bible study were saying, well, tell us more about that story. I'm like, I don't know about that story. I'm not Muslim. And then I think, I should dial a Muslim. So I hit speed dial 
for Heather. And I sat my phone on the table. She told us the most beautiful stories about Ishmael that deepened my own love of my own sacred text. And I could see, listening to her, I could hear in her and see, I see where God is speaking in this story to you. I find it so incredibly beautiful and moving. I wasn't the same after I just tried to do one thing that Jesus told me to do in a limited way. Just go try doing something that Jesus says to do. By the way, Nicodemus does. It takes him a long time. It takes him years. Three, probably, to be exact. Nicodemus left that meeting with Jesus and went back to his office. And the story goes on. And he tries to defend Jesus from the church council who's calling him a heretic, says, well, maybe we should give him a fair hearing. But he, he, only, he only mentions that in passing. He doesn't make a big stink about it. And then Jesus is crucified. And Nicodemus decides to go with Joseph of Arimathea. Not at night anymore. Not at night. Straight into the public square where Jesus' body is hanging from the cross. And he goes, and he doesn't care what anyone thinks. And he takes Jesus off the cross. And he uses all the spices and oil to give this man a dignified burial and puts him in a grave. You know that Nicodemus was changed forever by that. We don't know what happens to him at church the next Sunday. I don't think he cares anymore. Because he's been born from above. He scrapped his whole life and started again. One last thing. I know this is a long sermon. One last thing. I have a friend who got to spend a little time backstage at a circus and got to talk to the trapeze artists. He was particularly interested in what it's like to just be suspended hundreds of feet in the air and jump from one swing to the next in midair. And he was asking a trapeze artist, how do you do it? And the trapeze artist said, well, it's actually pretty hard, but very easy. All you do is jump, let the swing take you, and then you have to let go. And here's the other thing. When the person who is swinging towards you comes, what you have to remember is that you cannot grab onto his hands. Because if you grab onto his hands, you're going to break his wrists. What you have to do when you let go of that swing in midair is just trust the catcher to catch you. Jesus is the catcher. And if you want to have the life he has to offer, you just have to grab onto that swing and let go and trust him to catch you and be born anew. Amen.